Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this high-level panel on um, science policy as part of the EC's adaptation strategy. Um, my name is Paul Watkiss. I'm going to be the moderator for this afternoon, and we have a really interesting and fantastic, fantastic session for you with some great panelists. So we're really looking forward to this event. Today, we're going to dive down on one of the most interesting parts of the strategy. So we're going to look at the research, uh, the innovation, uh, the information, uh, that are set out in the strategy and focusing on those. And we have a wonderful panel of speakers who we're going to talk to. Um, just as some background, uh, obviously the strategy was launched on Wednesday. Um, it's a very good read. I really encourage you to have a look at it. And it does do things that take Europe in a new direction on adaptation. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of those before we um, start with our panelist. The first thing it does is it sets out a long-term vision and that vision is for the EU to be a climate resilient society fully adapted to the unavoidable impacts of climate change. And that's great. That gives us a long term ambition to strive towards. Of course, it also leads to some questions. And one of those questions is how much climate change do we have to adapt to? And the simple answer there is we don't know. Um, we are perhaps in a more positive place than we were a couple of years ago. Uh, certainly, if you look back a few years ago, we were heading very much towards three degrees. And one of the great things that has happened over the last couple of years, both from the Commission, but also from other areas, is that we are seeing um, commitments for um, uh, net zero. And what that's going to do is that's going to put us in the right direction. I think we also have to still be honest that getting towards even two degrees is going to be a challenge. Um, so we're going to have to adapt to quite a lot of climate change, but that's a positive. And the other thing that is in the strategy that I think is a real change in direction is to focus on um, a new approach to, uh, to research and a new mission based approach to delivering that. And that's something that we're going to really hear about this afternoon and it's an opportunity for all of us to ask some of the um, key players who have been involved in developing that approach and also some of the key participants in the landscape around that. So that's a real change and I think that does also lead to a couple of other questions. The question really is what type of research and innovation do we need to deliver a 2050 vision? Um, that's something that we need to start thinking about. And it's clear that we're going to have to do a different type of adaptation to the ones that we have been doing before. So uh, very much a shift from incremental and um, doing the same things, but doing them differently to transformational. And by transformational adaptation, we mean doing different things. Um, I've been very lucky to work on a transformational adaptation project over the last couple of years in Glasgow, uh, run by the Sniffer project. It's called Clyde Rebuilt and funded by Climate Kick. And the reason I mention that is because what that has done is it's made it very clear that we don't really know what transformational adaptation looks like yet. So one of the things that we're going to have to develop is a clear picture. And it's going to be clear that transformational adaptation is going to mean different things to different people. Um, it's not going to be the same everywhere, but it is going to be um, very much about um, systems thinking. You're hearing people talking about that. We're hearing people talking about governance changes and behavioral shifts. And those are things that are a very different research portfolio to what we've maybe been historically looking at. The other thing that we're going to have to bear in mind is that um, that shift, that transformation is going to be quite messy. What do I mean by that? I mean, it's not going to be a case where we get to 2022 and we flick a switch and we stop doing incremental adaptation and start doing transformational adaptation. It's going to involve lots of people doing different things, lots of people trying different approaches, and we're going to need a new way of doing research, I suspect, that allows us to test, experiment, succeed sometimes and fail and others. So it's going to be a new way of working as a research community. I think both of those are extremely interesting uh, and they really set up this panel discussion that we have for you this afternoon. So let me introduce our panel. Um, most of them need no introduction, of course, um, and we want to start with the adaptation strategy itself. So we have um, Clara de la Torre from uh, DG Clima, who's going to outline some of the key elements that are in the strategy. We then need to go and talk about some of the focus on research and innovation in the strategy. And uh, Mr. John Bell from RTD is going to give us uh, an overview of that. Obviously, a big shift has been um, the focus on the mission. And we have uh, Connie Hedegaard who's going to talk to us on the mission board on adaptation and societal <coughs> transformation. And then um, we have a series of interventions from people who are really leaders in this space 
we're going to talk about some of their perspectives to complement that. Uh, Kirsten Dunlop from EIT Climate Kick. We have Preeta Lindholm from the European Regions Research and Innovation Network. And we have Marku Makula from the Committee of the Regions. I think it's a really wonderful panel. I'm really looking forward to what they're going to say. What I will do is I'll go to each of our panelists in turn and ask them to talk. Um, uh, and then we will go um, pretty much um, through the panelists one by one. Um, please let us know if you have some slides. Um, and uh, what better way than to start with the strategy itself. Um, Clara, can I ask you to give your intervention and to provide your presentation and your uh, discussion on, on, on the strategy? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And gentlemen, after after two days uh, discussing about uh, about adaptation and the and the strategy of the European Commission, I would like on on behalf of the Director General of Climate Action to welcome this fantastic panel that we have this afternoon and all of you that are following us in web streaming. Um, we know uh, the, the the context of the, of this session. That the our our chair has done it beautifully, and. Um, just let us let us remind ourselves that uh, even if we could eliminate all the greenhouse gas emissions uh, tomorrow, we will still face the effects of our past emissions, and these effects will be lasting for the coming decades. So we have a huge job still to do ahead of us, and we know we should not forget either that this uh, climate crisis uh, affects every place in Europe, every place in the world, and every citizen's life and health. So it's not something that is, it is, uh, it is limited to certain parts of the world or certain parts of the population. It affects all of us everywhere. Um, we know that the world has just concluded the hottest decade on record, uh, during which the, the record of the hottest year has been, has been um, beaten eight times. This, this, uh, this extreme effects, they are, uh, and we, we've been hearing about the forest fires, the devastating droughts, but also from, from events that develop more slowly and less visibly, like desertification, loss of biodiversity, sea level rise, they are equally destructive, even if we don't see them. So in this context, uh, we, are, we, are, we are glad that we have uh, put on the table a new adaptation strategy um, that will, uh, will um, support the Union in becoming not only climate neutral by 2050, but also climate resilient by 2050. And this strategy has four main characteristics, let us say. One is an adaptation strategy, which becomes, which is smarter. The second is characteristic is a swifter. It is more systemic. And fourthly, not least, it gives a new impetus, a new focus to our climate diplomacy. Why do we say that we want uh, in, uh, to make this adaptation process um, messy? I, I, I took well note of what our moderator told us. Yes, it can be messy. It will be difficult anyhow. But how to make it smarter? We need, first and foremost, to have more data collection and more data sharing. Because we need this data, what for? To have more precise modeling on future hazards so that farmers can better plan their crops. Uh, their, um, the, the families buying a house would know which are the risks that they are going to, to or they may face in the future. Businesses also will, 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 will know what are the risks that the production facilities that they would have, for example, would be suffering. And of course, uh, the cities where a lot, a huge amount of a proportion of the population lives, will know better how to protect their residents from weather extremes. Um, we have also, it's with, why do we need data? We also need data to, to understand better what are the links between the, the devastating effects of climate change on health. And we are, uh, we have just launched, and there will be a formal launch next week, uh, uh, an observatory on um, climate and health. Needless to say, in the moment we are living, how important uh, it is uh, to, to understand and to, uh, to foresee uh, the events that are linked to, to health crisis. We also say that this, uh, this uh, strategy renders our, um, our adaptation policy uh, more systemic. 
Why more systemic? Because we are we are looking at our our eco ecosystem um, in in the strict sense of the word, but in the broader sense of the word, and we are targeting more what's, for example, all that happens at local level. We are aiming at giving tailored advice, especially for the most vulnerable uh, communities, that they are able to have the tools to find the expertise to plan the actions that are needed and to find the necessary resources to take action. We want to promote in this systemic approach more nature-based solutions. Uh, we want, for example, to, 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 to support the protection or restoration of, west, of wetlands, the development, the development of uh, urban green spaces. Um, and by the same token, we are not only addressing the climate uh, uh, adaptation um, challenge, but also we are addressing the loss in biodiversity that we are that we are suffering, and we are really cleaning our air as well, and we're having cooler cities. Systemic approach means also looking at how do we approach fiscal policies, because we know that the extreme weather conditions alone causes an average of 12 billion euro a year in losses. And when we think, for example, that um, uh, the effects of uh, sea level rise um, affect 40% of the European GDP, that um, because it's generated in coastal areas, we realize what we understand better what we mean by uh, by uh, taking uh, a systemic approach to our to our fiscal policies. Um, I'm sure we'll discuss another aspects of that later. So um, I'll go now to the third characteristic of this uh, of this um, um, strategy, which is making sure that adaptation takes uh, takes place faster. We need to bridge the gap between planning and implementation. And therefore, one of the things that we need is to reinforce the financing of these transformations needed. We are in talks for, in many respects, but in particular for adaptation with the European Investment Bank. But we are also in talks with the insurance sector, because we know that the protection gap uh, across Europe is still very high. And we know that, uh, that um, uh, those um, very often, those that are suffering this of this protection gap are the, uh, the most vulnerable parts of our society, of our economy. Um, and here, um, innovation, research and innovation plays an important role because if we need to adapt faster, we need to deploy faster the innovative solutions, whether technological or other, uh, to make sure that we uh, we really build a, a more resilient uh, a more resilient um, Europe, and for that Horizon Mission uh, in Horizon Europe mission, the mission in the framework program for research and innovation is one of the key uh, elements that we have. And uh, John and other members of the panel will be talking about that one. And finally, the fourth uh, Im important uh, feature I would like to, to highlight from this strategy is the, 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 the um, dimension, the international uh, dimension. As we know, the European Union has said that, um, and we are, we are driving by example, leading by example, what will be the first part of the, of the world to be climate neutral. But also, let us remember that the Paris Agreement establishes uh, goals for uh, adaptation and therefore, the European Union wants also to show the way and to lead by example, working in adaptation. Climate impact outside our borders will increasingly affect Europe as well. Um, so in our, what we call our climate diplomacy, adaptation has, has a, 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 an identity by itself. And this will be a very important aspect that will be discussed in, uh, will be addressed in the COP in NAS, uh, next autumn. So to finish, let me conclude that um, on research and innovation, which as I say, John Bell and other members of the panel will be addressing, it, it has a crucial role in this, uh, in this strategy. What for? To have a better informed decision-making process, to scale up the adaptation solutions and 
at the end of the day, have a, a world which is more resilient to uh, this climate change. Um, I have the honor of being having been just um, invited to be the, the, the mission manager, the mission of Horizon Europe manager, and I am glad that I will, I will be working in this important interface between research and innovation and the uh, policy on adaptation. So thank you very much and um, look forward to the subsequent discussion. Thank you ever so much, Clara, and congratulations on the appointment on the mission side. And that's great. And I, I think we all look at the activities there and um, I'm sure we're going to start seeing lots of questions. We have, we have one question already. Uh, again, I'd encourage people as we go through the workshop to submit a question at the bottom. Um, but we will take the questions at the end. So thank you very much, Clara. If I could ask now our next speaker, um, John, John Bell from RTD in the Commission. Um, are you going to give us some slides or are you going to talk to us, John? Uh, I was actually going to sing and tap dance at the same time. <laughs> well, I'll just speak very quickly so that nobody quite understands what I've said. That's what Irish people usually do in these situations. Um, so very quickly, Clara um, has opened on this uh, game changer, the climate resilience approach of the future. And Connie Hedigo will come afterwards to talk about the great work she's doing chairing the board with our colleagues, uh, uh, Yaro Misiak as well, who I see is here. Um, I'm, I'm responsible for what's called a healthy planet, which is a pretty serious KPI in the research department of the commission. And we're supporting this mission-based approach, which is asking of research to take a different stance. We're at one of the few points in human history where science and research have an obligation not to observe, but to act, to set direction, to demonstrate solutions, to de-risk uh, what can be invested in uh, for society and to try and support the democratization of deliberation, which is going to be one of the key uh, difficulties. We see in the pandemic at the moment how these kind of uh, uh, changes in transformation are so complex. So research innovation has to step in to support a longer term framing and enabling uh, of this transformation process. So resilience as we all know, uh, has gone from being an abstract concept to a way of life for us. And the Green Deal of the European Union is what the European Union is for for the next 30 years. And that is basically to make resilience a right and an expectation for citizens and communities and regions. And whether we're talking about the economy or we're talking about ecosystems or we're talking about people. So how does research and innovation fit into this? As I said, it moves uh, a bit like um, this discussion about transformation, research innovation itself needs to be transformed. And that's why we call on all of you across disciplines and actions and uh, specificities to think and move and work together in this mission form of thinking, which is to deliver uh, measurable inspirational goals that are transformational over a period of time using all of the available means. One of the things that research innovation, by the way, has to do is not to replicate the innovation gap in a resilience gap as we move forward. So it has to be a journey where everybody's brought forward, not just the people who've got the great universities and the great infrastructures. It has to be something which is a fundamental part of being in the European Union, because the European Union, if it's about anything, it's about we are more resilient together and with the diversity that we have than we are separately. The climate resilient concept that you see in the climate adaptation strategy will be fundamentally supported by the ambition of the mission uh, on climate resilience for all parts of Europe, which is three basic objectives, which no doubt Connie will uh, bring us to, which is making sure that everybody is prepared to deal with the disruptions which are coming, um, to accelerate the transformations and the transitions, and to demonstrate in a deep way the resilient and scalable solutions for what are going to be unforeseeable uh, kinds of systemic changes. Uh, I give an example. This morning we saw reports on the, the uh, um, ocean research, which is showing us again that the uh, overturning circulation current in the oceans is going to lead to very unpredictable uh, modelling for weather and so forth. So how do we build our cities and how do we deal with our infrastructures and our food systems and our life support systems, our health systems, uh, our water systems, our economies in, in that light? We have to approach things in a new way in a systemic way. The political issue is not normally the, the area for researchers, but one of the things we have to test and learn is how to do and demonstrate deliberative transformation, 
how are we actually going to make how are we actually going to make uh, it possible for citizens, communities, and regions and countries to make long-term decisions based on evidence that may have far-reaching consequences and require major investment? And last but not least, in this great recovery process which is being launched, we have a, a next generation Europe facility, the recovery and re resilience facility. How are we going to hardwire resilience into recovery? So research and innovation has to deal with all of these issues. Uh, and it's going to have to deal with them in very, in very pragmatic ways. Um, and uh, partly what we'll do is we'll start by working now in this phase from the report that we've received from the mission board through to uh, the project team of vice president and commissioners in June, where they've asked us to produce an implementation plan, looking within the uh, goals of these missions and identifying against a number of criteria, for example, added value, buy-in and so forth, um, how we would actually action uh, if you want to call them not moonshot, but earth sh earthshot act actions on a scale that has not been attempted before. Horizon Europe, of course, will be a big part of that. Uh, many of you will know that the cluster approach in Horizon Europe is thinking about that in cluster six and five and four and others. We'll be looking at how we mobilize research, convene research, that very special form of European integration that the framework program bodies how we work with these new, new partnerships at member states around biodiversity and water, ecosystems and food, uh, and how are we going to work with the investment instruments that they have the intelligence and the de-risking that they need to make the big stakes investments that are available in terms of the unprecedented wall of money that's available to member states and regions to make these transformations. So research innovation has a pretty big task ahead of it, but we're informed by a brilliant report and a, a real mobilization, I think, that people realize that unlike previous transformations in human history, science gives a sense of what's ahead and how to frame the problem. The question now is, can we mobilize people to produce the solutions as a society, as scientists, as investors, as regions, communities, and as people? Thank you. Ever so much, John. That was um, incredibly informative, and the, the switch and the move in uh, everything you've described sounds really um, interesting. What I'd like to do now is go to our next speaker, uh, Connie Hedegaard, who's going to give us um, an, an update and uh, a, a discussion on the mission board on climate adaptation and social transformation. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Connie. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, first, I would like to congratulate actually uh, Clara de la Torre and the team at DG Clima for the adaptation strategy that was launched earlier this week. I must say that it's it's really good to see that what we started back in 2013 has now got an even sort of stronger push forward for for the European level how how to address this. I do think, however, then also that uh, the fact that the Commission will have to write that uh, we are not imposing things on member states, uh, no compulsory risk assessment and things like that, it also shows how challenging an endeavour it is really to make Euro Europe as such uh, climate resilient and adapted to climate change. But, but it's good to see how the Commission promises to provide uh, the tools. And the question then is, can a mission on adaptation to climate change and societal change, as is our full title, can we make any difference there? Can we help deliver the many things that we see now in this adaptation strategy? And uh, I think that many of the things have already been mentioned. Uh, we had this scoping paper out back in September, and now, as was said also by John, we are working on a very specific and detailed implementation plan it is clear that when we sort of picked our sort of headline, called it a climate resilient Europe, there are many things you would look into and where there are knowledge gaps and technology gaps and all this and water management and ecosystem services, really many things. But I also think that it's fair to say that beyond health and welfare and behavior, these things, we are also very much uh, having to address uh, social and economic and political systems change. And as all of you will know, that is easier said than done. But my feeling is that the more we dig into this, the stronger it stands out, that that is where some of the really big challenges for our societies are. In order for us not just to have sort of the, uh, the legs up in, in the blue air, um, we, we will work with 
200, we say 200 regions to try to sort of through the work that they are doing and we can do with them, the mission can do with them, try to identify where are there some lessons learned, where are there some gaps that should be identified, including some knowledge gaps. In 100 regions or thereabout, we would have deep demonstrators uh, and the whole purpose there is uh, to try and, and get uh, lessons learned that can be scaled much faster. And I think that when I read the adaptation strategy, uh, some of the challenges that is sort of pinpoint there is also something that we are trying to address. For instance, a better understanding of climate risk and exposure and how to adopt climate risk management. Uh, for instance, as mentioned, how for Europe to be better and faster at take learnings across borders. I think there is a tendency in this adaptation field that everyone goes for itself in the community, in the region, in the nation states. Um, how to deploy, uh, I think uh, Clara was mentioning that also, how to deploy new smart solutions faster and more efficient. And right now in the, the work with the implementation plan, we are trying to identify and, and put fle flesh and blood on 10 areas of innovation. And I would say to those of you who are listening in here, please don't hesitate. We are still open for your input and whatever guidance and good ideas you can come up with, don't hesitate to sort of uh, take care that it gets to the mission board secretariat. And one of the key challenges we are faced with is how, how do we take care that what we are uh, doing, that that we can test real transform, transformative solutions. So many solutions being tested out there, but real transformative solutions. And how can we ensure that some of the wide gaps in our adaptation knowledge that also the strategy is alluding to, uh, that we can reduce uh, that, that we can close the gaps. I think that one of the things that stands out very clear from the adaptation strategy is the need for better data and data that will be available to those who really take the decisions. And, and the last point is maybe as, as important as the first one. And so I think that there is one thing and that is on the socioeconomic vulnerabilities that we are not always very good at addressing, speaking generally for, for us in, 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 in Europe when we are talking about adaptation and resilience. And also here, there is a very, very uh, big focus area for us in the mission board. We need to bring much more into the picture this aspect and it should be reflected when we also talk about the nexus science and politics. Uh, both Paul and John referred to that maybe research in itself should also change and uh, we have been discussing so much about interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity I think we still have a lot to do. How do we really use and maximize sort of the knowledge that we have and bring it into play? And I say this also as a former decision maker, myself and former politician, so much knowledge is out there, but it is not available when those taking the decisions uh, need it. And that goes even more if you go out to the community level or the regional level. So I'm very happy to see that in the strategy, there is this recognition that efficient and inclusive governance that ensures the dialogue between policymakers and scientists, that has to be a focal point. And that is very much one of the things that we are trying to address. Very last point, um, we have this need for accelerated um, action uh, in this extremely complex challenge of creating resilient societies. But on the other hand, and that is a very strong focus for us, that is how can we carry the citizens in this huge transformation? I mean, there is a dilemma between speedy action, grand scale action, and then still having it anchored with people in, in the real world and not make this a thing that can polarize things even further. So I think we have the schisma between bottom up with the citizens and then efficient systems. Uh, so how we manage to modernize the, the system of politics, the, the way our organizations, our administrations, how they work. I think that should also be a, uh, some of the things that we are looking into also when we ask for new research and innovation. 
uh, there has been a tendency here that the whole area that we are discussing around climate and adaptation and resilience has been very much on technology, very much on natural science, to a certain degree also on economic science. But we need so much the social science and humanities also to come into the, the, the picture here because the complexity is so challenging and we must be sure uh, how to carry uh, the way we do, how to carry the, the, the people while we do these things. So I think there is a huge challenge for our behavior and to have that uh, really front and center that will also be part of what we are trying to do in the mission. Final word, we will have to come up with an implementation plan by the end of May. And then as John said, the commissioners should decide whether our mission should have a green light before the summer recess. So I'm just mentioning this because up till May, there is still room for any of you who would want to chip in with good ideas that we should bear in mind. Thank you very much. Great, thank you ever so much. Um, I uh, think we all want to congratulate you on the on the ambition of the mission. Um, 200 regions reaching policymakers and citizens. I think it's a, a, a it's a challenge. We all recognize that, but also it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, what we want to do now is going to go to a number of other speakers to give us some reflections. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to Kirsten Dunlop from EIT Climate Kick. Uh, Kirsten, I think you have some slides that you will also share with us. Uh, and over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Let me just check the sound is working. Yep. The sound is working. Um, I'll Good. stay online here and just uh, and we can also see your screen as well. So that's Fantastic. all working perfectly. All right, so I thought uh, I might just put up a few slides because I will very much be uh, complementing this with a sense of what do some of those practical approaches look like and what does it mean to adapt research and innovation in, in concrete terms to the ambitions, the very, very welcome ambitions and the strategy that uh, has and is being launched now. Um, so let me just start very quickly with uh, a little sense of what Climate Kick is and where I'm speaking from. EIT Climate Kick is part of the European Union toolkit, if you like, um, funded by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, now about 12 years old, and working very much on climate mitigation and adaptation. We have a 10, 12 year track record now in, of orchestrating innovation for climate change adaptation, including the critical elements that Connie and Clara both referred to with respect to citizens, bringing people with us kind of in every walk of life. Um, we work across the full perimeter of Europe with innovators of all sorts from public bodies, research, business, community groups and startups. Um, and we work to deliver together. We are a community delivering collaborative action and innovation in a collaborative mode. Now, I would, what I want to do is just give a little bit of a sense in this context of what does it mean to launch a strategy that is such an important statement about the future, imp the essential importance of adaptation in Europe's climate action, climate leadership, um, and climate responses. And John, I, I love the description of the Green Deal as what the EU stands for for the next 30 years. That's wonderfully reassuring. Um, and look at what does that mean in practice. Uh, climate Kick has been, as I said, working in, in climate adaptation for a long time and connecting, of really working to connect uh, different combinations of innovations together in order to address the full range of challenges that sit in the world of adaptation. And that includes elements like how do we get better quality information? How do we deliver that in real time to people experiencing either catastrophic weather events or about to, to businesses trying to work out what decisions to make, to farmers trying to judge what type of seed to use, how much water to use or what to expect and how to adjust very rapidly. A lot of it has to be, has a lot of the innovations so far have had to do with trying to roll climate risk up into credit and bond ratings and make it visible and transparent and disclosed, working very hard on landscape and supply chain climate services, weaving them into business models so there's a much more concrete understanding. You are looking into and will be moving and operating in a changed environment and that needs to be baked in. Beginning to tap in, and this is just the beginning, to an enormous wealth of possibility in terms of nature-based solutions. And that's everything from learning from, from knowledge that we let behind in the past 
through to advanced technologies in biomimicry or in, for example, nanocrystallization of lignin, starting to use plant-based organic materials, wood, wood in construction completely differently for much more resilient outcomes. Bringing in finance, risk literacy, and critically social change, regulatory change, and risk reserving, risk management insurance change. And what I wanted to do is give a sense of, so the, the lighthouse call that the strategy, the EU adaptation strategy offers us um, is one that opens up some really important uh, invitations to work indeed smarter, stronger, and more systemic. And in the work that we've been doing, there are some key learnings from the last 10 years to really inject into the strategy as we go forward and we take it to implementation and we harness it into the powerful framework of the missions. One of them, and firstly, is the importance of developing and, and kind of nurturing in a sense of kind of collective agency and co-creation, a really bold narrative of climate resilience being at the absolute heart of Europe's recovery. It's not plan B, it's not an option. It's in fact, now that we really are in an age of climate emergency, it's a hygiene factor. It's literally the absolute essence of what we need to do. And it's the bridge to climate mitigation in so many ways. It's good for business, it's good for competitiveness, it's good for jobs, it's good for confidence, for emotional well-being, community well-being, health and security, some of the critical lessons we've learned through COVID. And it can be achieved side by side and must go together as part of the European Green Deal and the EU's recovery. I think there's also, in, in terms of market signals, markets, as we know, respond well to strong, consistent, and reasonably reliable signals of direction, even if they don't like the implications of the direction, emphasizing resilience and Europe's commitment to resilience will attract and pull through investment. It will stimulate in innovation and it will stimulate a much more liquid financial market in climate management and risk services, as long as we're consistent. I think secondly, there is, and I'm gonna go in here some, some examples uh, to unpack some of these. It really is critical when we say systemic to make that real and genuine. We, there's been enormous progress in and inspiring examples of adaptation in Europe um, and a huge pressure to make rapid and visible progress that has led often, however, to a focus on easy to measure standalone projects that can be plugged in and can be looked at and kind of, I won't say exactly a, tip, a tick box exercise, but it comes close sometimes where we are looking to solve a particular problem with a particular solution and be able to say we've done something. And that does include the way in which we're tackling issues either through direct or existing policy levers or by sector by sector mainstreaming. So I think it's very important now with the invitation of the strategy, with the policy framework that it creates, with the market signal it creates, to now move firmly on from setting separate sector by sector adaptation goals or treating adaptation as a purely technical challenge. This is very much about systemic challenges. And I'm going to give an example of what that looks like in practice. This again, if you like, is raw training data from, from the edge of, of where Climate Kick is operating in what we call deep demonstrations. And, and the reference that Connie made to the deep demonstrators of, of the mission is a very, very uh, important and valuable follow through. And we've learned an enormous lot about working in this mode. What, what it has meant for us has been to create a perimeter for innovation that is grounded and working back from the place-based needs that we have. So working with particular agricultural regions and landscapes like Clyde, for example, working with particular governments, working with cities, working with local communities and naming and trying to understand and scope how much would need to change here for this region, this agricultural area, this set of practices and communities to survive greater heat, uh, violent storms, sea level rise, changes in, in precipitation, changes in diseases and insects and biodiversity and so on. And what would that describe as a framework for action and what, how would we intervene in all of the possible change levers and intervention points that we have 
to move with? Um, how do we simultaneously launch innovations in markets, in citizen participation, in funding, in technology, and not just one or two, multiple innovations that really can act together, that can talk to one another, that can be connected up so that we can look for synergies and possibilities in very, very systemic ways on the ground. And this is work that is happening at the moment in, in, in Novelakiten, Glasgow and the Dolomites region and Lucia, and really looking hard and fast to test commitment and, and solutions to, for resilience to severe droughts, to floods, to heat waves, but also to the social and emotional stresses of change, of discontinuous change to people's expectations and habits and practices and the fear that comes with that, as well as the economic disruption. We've also been piloting a number of innovation tools in 2020, working with some of our design partners, such as the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, using something called cartoonathons. And in this particular case, uh, before the COVID one, we, we ran one on climate darkness and climate grief because there is so much anxiety about the injustice, the fundamental injustice of climate change, helping participants to imagine transformative futures that go beyond dystopias and co-creation, developing together augmented reality applications for mobile devices that allow some form of quick community, collective on the ground connection around mission, uh, important practical responses to adaptation and to climate transformation. We've been working very hard on the uncertainty and the risks that are associated with the climate call for adaptation and for climate risk data. Um, this is an example for, uh, of a community movement in Florence. So, uh, particularly, it won our Climathon Awards last year, actually, because it's a very, very powerful example of ground up and at the same time overarching top down policy encouragement of, an, of using community parks within an urban environment to create spaces for rebuilding, for recovery, for resilience, for bringing, for rewilding and creating spaces of mental, emotional, but also practical uh, rebuilding of sterile urban environments, of urban environments in which people are locked down or locked up and beginning to comprehend fully the implications of large scale systemic change. So it is an example of community initiatives on the ground. I mentioned the importance of the third learning of working in partnership with the private sector. From our perspective, this is absolutely key. Uh, Clara referred to two critical things, the question of information and the question of deploying the financial mechanisms to support adaptation. Um, this is one example, a couple of examples, working with Icebreaker One, for example, is about creating the data infrastructure that is needed to address climate change and particularly doing so through open standard-based marketplace that bridge the gaps between the information gaps between finance, between assets, between policy and, and science so that significant amounts of funding can start to flow through to adaptation and climate risk responses. Um, another example would be OASIS. Uh, again, the OASIS hub is working on the insurance and the risk modeling side, helping users to feed in, and this is from citizen science ups, upwards through to large scale modeling, a range of hazards and exposures and vulnerability information in order to calculate damage risk and the potential financial cost of events, both for governments and for private actors, but also begin to stimulate the kind of business model transformations of, for example, the insurance industry towards prevention models, financing prevention, rather than the increasingly narrow gap for uh, narrow window for insurability with respect to climate risk and to the responses that we're going to need to come up with as we go forward. And finally, just to come back to the fourth of these learnings, I think it is, and I would really uh, double down on the reference and the explanation that Clara made around the importance of a global view. Uh, Europe's resilience will and does rely on the resilience of others, whether in neighboring countries or through those that are linked uh, in global production, value change and consumption networks. We've seen that in sharp, sharp relief, for example, in the pressures on the, the food supply chain during the early part of the COVID crisis. And we know that countries in the global south have some of the most well-developed and advanced experiences of adaptation and can provide learnings for the European Union. So my reflection would be to effectively scale, tackle the scale and the complexity of the climate crisis 
and adapt to the impacts on the ground does require development and scaling of innovation approaches, but it also requires a structural rethink of the way we're doing innovation very much towards the direction of mission aligned um, frameworks, systemic, um, systemic actions and portfolio thinking that allows us to draw together place-based real economy actions connected, simultaneous and inherently diverse so that we can then pull in to regions, transformate transformative regions as assets, the kind of unprecedented funding and investment structures that we will need to do. So I very much welcome the publication of the strategy, welcome the Commission's leadership in this, and particularly welcome the extent to which the invitation to, to go faster, smarter, stronger, and more systemic in the way that the adaptation strategy describes it is an extraordinary opportunity to realize the vision for 2050 of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsten. And we definitely need innovators like Climate Kick out there, um, particularly uh, in, in getting those messages and learning from each other. So thank you ever so much. We are now going to go to Perita Lindholm from the European Regions Research and Innovation Network. Um, and if I can check, uh, we can see you. I'll stay on until we can hear you. Yes. That's brilliant. And you, do you have any slides or are you going to? No, no, I will just uh, speak. Thank you. Over Thanks to you. a lot. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for inviting Erin um, uh, to this panel. Um, it's really in excellent to see such a strong uh, in in influence or, or um, putting such a strong emphasis on local and regional level um, on the discussion today. The ones who do not know Erin, uh, we are a network of, of um, regions that bring together uh, what, about 120 um, uh, regional ecosystems as we, as we really work very closely with the different RNI actors on the ground. Um, today I was uh, also very pleased to see the tight connection that has been made with the EU adaptation strategy and with the mission. This is on one hand a uh, um, uh, great uh, acknowledgement of, of the good collaboration that we can see at the EU level on this uh, topic now and also allows me to uh, bring a couple of key elements uh, up from the uh, strategy that are very relevant for local and regional level but also um, in my perspective very closely linked to the mission uh, of the um, climate adaptation. Um, so the first one is more systemic approach, the more systemic adaptation. Second one is the faster adaptation. And the third one is something that is highlighted at the conclusion of the, of the strategy, which is a kind of more action orientation. So moving from uh, a public concern, so um, uh, adaptation being a public concern to a really uh, mass action uh, on this topic. So if I go to the to the um, issue of a more systemic adaptation. Of course, uh, the first thing um, in the in the strategy that is very um, um, very much in the heart of the um, heart of the um, policy is really creating this umbrella of the different um, bringing together uh, all the adaptation related policies to, uh, in one uh, kind of a, a set. So connecting the dots. This is absolutely essential uh, for, for getting towards this uh, more systematic um, approach. Um, we also welcome, of course, there the, the link that is made for, for involving further the regional bodies, also in a kind of agenda setting related to adaptation. So this is uh, something uh, that is very important to see in the new um, in the strategy. Um, when we look at the um, uh, um, look at the the um, uh, part on faster adaptation, this is where the mission comes in. Although I would already see um, a kind of a strong link with the systemic uh, part uh, of the of the strategy when it comes to the mission. Um, there were a couple of elements that some of the colleagues were already highlighting in this faster adaptation, and there uh, the first one was is this. Um, um, new uh, governance models required the different, uh, the new kind of a collaborative element that is uh, part of the mission. So there, um, um, I would actually say it's, it's um, 
it's going beyond all that what some colleagues were saying now, um, kind of um, bringing, um, doing further uh, evidence-informed evidence, evidence uh, informed decision making. It's really about new model of collaborating together. So um, in where we, uh, how we see this is, it is really that at local and regional level, we mobilize those different actors. We bring the key stakeholders together. Uh, Kirsten was highlighting the importance of working with private sector. Of course, this is one element. So we will need to work with pri private sector. We work with the knowledge providers. We work with farmers, uh, with different stakeholders uh, uh, in a kind of a pact that is uh, highlighted in the mission, which is the uh, call there, the Climate Resilience Pact. So this is really crucial uh, for this systemic, um, uh, faster, transformative um, adaptation. Maybe, maybe there to also to, to, to highlight uh, some of the uh, previous speakers were talking about indeed um, going beyond technology. And this is really something that, of course, technology remains, remains important, but having this um, um, the strong link to this governance uh, innovation, uh, this is really a key in the mission. Um, uh, then Clara was uh, talking about the financial package. Um, of course, uh, this is another element which is very important, um, uh, pulling financial resources together. Um, this on one hand, uh, in, in our view, should mean also bringing together the EU national and regional uh, funding opportunities. So kind of harvesting those complementarities between those uh, funding instruments. And then once we have that package, uh, as of course, to complement it with the, um, with the financial instruments, with the, with the different um, private sector financing required. But also um, uh, taking this uh, a kind of a systemic approach in a way uh, from that, uh, for, for this financial dimension as well. And then um, going to the third uh, element, which is the um, action orientation. Um, I think there were also some, some of the speakers were saying knowledge is there about how do we kind of tap into it. Um, um, well, we, we very much appreciate this type of a more kind of a hands-on approach that we can see in, in, the, in the strategy. And um, uh, for the moment, what we've been doing in the context of, of Erin is that we are, have about 20, uh, 25 uh, regions whom we have been following quite closely the, the developments of, of the mission. Uh, this is a very diverse group. As uh, John Bell was saying, um, we should uh, bring uh, resilience forward together. Uh, so it's, it's uh, not about only about front runners who are of course very active and can uh, act, help and support this acceleration part, but it's also about um, uh, identifying uh, regions that um, uh, identify the adaptation dimension, some aspects of ad adaptation as important parts of their regional, uh, interregional collaboration, for example. And, and finally, also bringing together uh, regions that um, maybe are still uh, learning, but um, always uh, have um, at least a very good motivation and have identified uh, the, the aspects of adaptation as a key policy dimension in the uh, regional uh, policies. So um, in short, um, what um, we have is a more very motivated group of plus 20 regions who are also uh, very much appreciating the collaboration with the commission with, uh, and, um, um, on, on this uh, uh, topic and also uh, allowing us to, to discuss the implement, implementation plan, those different uh, areas that uh, should be included there. And, um, and we, this, this dialogue hopefully will help us uh, in going forward with a more systemic, more uh, smart, uh, faster adaptation um, together with the actual um, stakeholders from those regions. 
So um, actually, I will stop here and say thank you for, for, for having me and uh, looking forward to the discussion part. Thank you ever so much. And it is um, really great to see the focus on regions. We had a focus in cities on the 2013 adaptation strategy. We're thinking bigger now, and I think it's great to see that shift as well. So last but not least, we uh, will go to our final speaker, um, Marku Makula from the Committee of the Regions. I can see you now. Are you going to give us a presentation or just- I'll uh, just talk, yeah. And I can hear you very clearly. Um, so thank you, over to you. Thank you, and thank you very much. And uh, let me first uh, refer to the previous speaky speakers by pointing out that everyone is talking about need for ga game changers, accelerate different activities. But if I'm very honest, so, so what I hear quite often as, as well as uh, a local and regional politician, the president of the Helsinki region and the chair of the board of Espo city uh, board. So, so what I hear often is that the only thing that is really accelerating is that the climate change itself and the mitigations actions uh, lack behind. And especially uh, people in industry and, and in universities, when we talk about some coming uh, measures, so they uh, come back by saying that we already heard last July, close to a year ago, EU Commission and the Council saying that now we have the breakthrough, there will be the recovery funds, uh, 750 billion on, on this and this and this. So and that EU is going to speed up the, transform, the positive required transformation. But it, it takes time. So the political decision making is too slow. Luckily, as we've heard uh, today, uh, Connie was stressing heavily that the, the, the big missions, they all are moving to action with the quite detailed implementation plan. So we wait for that and we, from the uh, Committee of the Region, from the CR, will contribute to that. Uh, we have regular discussions going on how the missions would best serve the activities on the ground. And we definitely, with uh, Clara and John, I've, we have personally met as well several times, both of you, and especially what is the role of research and, and new technology in uh, renewing uh, process industries or building these uh, regional innovation ecosystems. And those are the kind of cornerstones that from the CR perspective, we bring all the time to the table that that is the local level where the action is. And that is why we need to focus more on that. And let me just first highlight a few of the key points I as well uh, these years more and more focused uh, my own interest on the climate uh, change and uh, implementing SDGs so sustainable development needs to be all integrated in our local city and region policy. And I've been now the rapporteur on uh, climate adaptation. We had a very good discussions with the German presidency and now we continue on that and, and on that the official opinion. So practically, I'm very proud to say that practically all more than 300 of our members, mayors, regional presidents, councillors from all parts of Europe, so who are the members of the COR. So in our official opinion, we highlight the importance of cities and regions playing an active role, joining forces with local and industrial, uh, in international industry to adapt to and uh, mitigate climate change by adapting uh, increasingly ambitious targets. So, and uh, on there, so there are a lot of evidence that even the Paris agreements and the measures taken uh, to implement that, they are not at all enough. We need to move much, much faster. And I'll highlight a few points, points on that as well. But let me here link this uh, to that very good points on this new adaptation strategy 
the CR, we will officially kind of update our opinion and come back to the concrete measures, which are the act, 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 actions that uh, best uh, mobilize activities local level. And when talking about cities, I always mean as well industry, large and small, our startups, especially a new uh, technology focused uh, innovation companies, growth companies, you, of course, universities, other educational establishments and research centers. So that is what the city is today. It's not anymore the civil servants with their elected city councillors, but it's really this par local collaboration moving strongly ahead. And we definitely highlight that cities and regions are the innovators and uh, trailblazers on climate action and adaptation. But again, when saying this, we of course work very closely with the, let's say, take EIT kicks, climate of course, especially, but the other kicks as well. So it's a local industry that we want to be strongly contributing on that. Uh, we are uh, especially eager to move on, on with the mission. So those both uh, the emissions on smart resilient cities and the ones on the adaptation they are all instruments and uh, really weighted instruments that we at the city level uh, could use let me here bring a couple of the examples what this can mean because at the same time with commissioner maria gabriel we have a very in-depth uh, joint action plan uh, signed by the Commission and uh, the Committee of the Regions. And there are 15 pages of targeted, uh, let's say, action and action plans more on what that could be. And one of those is the ERA hubs, the European Research Area hubs, but hubs that are more built on the local ecosystem uh, from the city and region perspective, how to implement new initiatives, how to use the latest scientific knowledge. So it means in practice that we need to work more with the, let's say the universities of applied sciences and with the local industry. And this is very much what we want to bring by integrating this uh, mission and especially the whole green and digital to these measures from bottom up. And if I highlight, let's say, big industrial activities, investments on that. So if I take the, uh, let's say, northern part of Europe, uh, the collaboration between Finland and Sweden in the, uh, 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 the Baltic Sea and the Sportnia Arch, the northern parts of the sea. So we have there close to a million inhabitants. We have uh, good universities on Finland side, Oulu, on uh, Sweden side, Luleå, and we have huge industries there, especially on iron and steel. And if I take that, the, the uh, SSAB, the big uh, iron and steel company operating in both of these countries. So they are now ready to invest billions of euros uh, in their renewing their processes with hydrogen. Uh, so, and when they are at the moment, they are producing one tenth of the uh, 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 climate, uh, climate CO2 emissions, so they can increase this close to zero. And this is a big investment where we need to take these kind of examples on both dealing with these era hubs, so latest technological research by the universities, and then as well with the missions and uh, uh, how to use the Green Deal financing the uh, recovery funds and both uh, national governments are ready to, to, uh, to use these as cases in the investing in these investments. But it means integrating public and private. Or if I come south or with this, okay, again, cross-border collaboration in the Helsinki region with our extensive uh, uh, innovation uh, platform activities, the ecosystems. So we want to build this as a real, let's say, era hub together with the uh, the Estonia, with Tallinn and the surroundings. So it's an area of 2.5 million people and very much uh, 
uh, cultural collaboration already, but that can really be as well a good example what integrating green and di digital with the private means in as well. And let me then uh, uh, integrate this, that one of our messages is that EU should be faster in, uh, let's say, renewing the CO2 pricing system. And that is very important since since the pricing system is uh, stable, uh, uh, motivating for in investments that is needed for the long-term investments of industry, because there the activities come and they are taken in in a couple of the let's say phases. First, it's the investment in uh, research base for future. Uh, uh, processes, industrial processes, metallurgical and pulp and paper processes. The second uh, phase on this uh, value chain is proven technological solutions at pilot scale to optimize the processes for demonstration plant operations. And then the third step is the proven technical and commercially feasible solution at an industrial scale. These are the ones that take billions or tens of billions or hundreds of billions of euros investments creating this sustainable growth because they are all being them in the iron and steel or pulp and paper industry. So they are ex enormously reducing the carbon uh, reduction and, and so carbon targets are the ones and in the Helsinki region with Tallinn, so we are looking for to be carbon neutral already by 2035 latest, latest many uh, cities as far as an example, we want to be that already earlier. So 2030 is our target year for carbon neutrality, but that's done together with the industry. So energy investments, energy grid, the whole energy system, both heating and cooling and electricity. Uh, there are more than 10 parallel activities going on. All our latest technology that can be scaled up in other parts of Europe. So with these, as we said in the official opinion that we want to work more detail with the EU Joint Research Centre and different uh, uh, DGs, so to have the, the best knowledge be really a forerunner helping the, the whole Europe to be active and, and getting the ambitious targets to be fulfilled. And there uh, as well, it's said there in the official opinion as well, deepening the collaboration with the uh, EIT kick. So there's many of these kind of activities. They are very much bottom up. And now with the missions, that's time to move ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you ever so much. That was great. Now, what I would like to do is to ask all our speakers to appear on the screen. This is a bit like me beckoning you up to the stage, if you can imagine the real world, if we can even remember what the real world was like. Um, I um, will, um, I have a series of questions that we have already been asked. And I'll put a few of those to you and we may try and get someone to ask. Um, I think the first question is probably one that we, um, across the panel, you may all have something to say about, which is about um, very much the balance on all of this between the private sector, between the public sector and the third sector you know, in terms of whether that's on innovation and research or if that's in delivery of the adaptation strategy. So um, maybe that's an open question about what you think that balance is and, and I'll um, throw the floor open. You can just indicate perhaps if you want to um, say something on this one uh, and we'll, um, but we, this might be a question that you all want to have uh, a response to. So anyone feel particularly strongly about that balance between um, taking this forward between the um, public and the private sector, the role for the private sector indeed. Who's going to be brave and drop himself? Connie, was that, a, was, that a, was that an offer? <laughs> you look like an offer. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, I can give it a try. I just think that, I mean, as what, what we have heard, we need much more cooperation, public, private, internally in organizations between different policy levels. I mean, just can you imagine to find out how to work with 200 regions from the EU, sort of going, uh, passing by the, the national level, just a thing like that. It sounds simple, it should be simple, it's not simple. To work together, it both horizontal and vertically, it's, it's extremely challenging for all our systems. 
And, and I really believe that we, and, and I say this, and normally I don't use my former party sort of color, but as a, as a former minister for the Conservative Party in Denmark, we need more politics. We need policymakers that dare set up the regulation, the framework, the direction, maybe particularly when it comes to adaptation and resilience, because we need the market to go in and finance and do, do business with a lot of these things. But if you do not sort of put up the standards, put up the requirements, make climate proofing of infrastructure projects, make the building codes, all these kind of things, it cannot be that we continue to shy away too much to use the, the political instruments because we would be too slow in achieving what we want to achieve and then it will end up being much more costly also in human consequences. So more regulation, more politics, sorry to say, but I cannot see how we can solve it without that. Thank you. I can see um, Kirsten has a hand up and then we'll go to Clara afterwards uh, and then we'll go on to the next question perhaps. Uh, Kirsten. I, I think there's one, uh, there's one very strong opportunity we have here, and that is to draw on, in some ways, some of the precedents from our bad learnings of the past and the frameworks that we have. And that would be to use, for example, solvency frameworks, to use some of the requirements around good governance to really introduce very strongly the concept of strategic risk. If you are a business looking forward to the next 30 or 40 years, you will be dealing with extraordinary degrees of disruption in literally every sector, except possibly those that are in climate services. And even then you're gonna be dealing with very volatile markets. So framing up one, one very effective way in my experience of engaging industry directly is to define this problem in the terms that those responsible for leading and for the stewardship and the entrepreneurship of business care deeply about. Um, and I speak as somebody who lived and worked in that world and was operating right in that space. As soon as you start to name concretely, this is what climate risk looks like in terms of business disruption, in terms of gross annual revenue projected in the next 10 years lost, in terms of cost of adaptation to regulation, to changed market signals and market prices. Acting early now to prevent, to take stakes, to invest in the innovation that creates more stable business model adaptations and business model adjustments and has the virtuous effect of reducing or mitigating underlying risk to businesses and giving them a position in the new markets of the future, in circularity, in resilient materials, in different kinds of, of urban planning and infrastructure and nature-based solutions. It's a wise, it's a prudent, and it's a, a, a well-governed move compared to assuming that the, the status quo is safer when the status quo represents risk in itself. So I think there's, there are real opportunities and, and something like the adaptation strategy creates a policy framework to legitimize and argue for strategic risk landed straight to the tables of boards of directors to say, where is your mitigation plan here? Where's your adaptation plan? Where is your portfolio of innovation to adapt your core business model to a world in which these things are written into policy, written into regulation and a reality in the market? Thank you. And I think um, absolutely the, the shift we have seen in the private sector and um, partly driven by the task force on climate related financial disclosure is starting to get this onto boards. And I, I see that as one shift that wasn't around in 2013 in the last adaptation strategy. Maraku, I can see that you still have your hand up and please an opportunity for you to also add. You have already mentioned this. I think yeah. it's great. Uh, I'll just add to that uh, since uh, Connie very importantly raised the importance of policy making and uh, political decision making and I, I fully agree of course because I'm, I'm part of that group of people but I see that the huge the gap between where is the, the latest innovation knowledge and the political decision that it's, it's huge nowadays and that is a good reason to, to link this so that uh, with the climate policy green deal so with the committee of the region we are now continuing our efforts with the joint research center in organizing these what we call the science meet regions uh, pirita referred to the evidence informed policy making and that is 
where we need more of these actions. And one of the ideas for that is that we are proposing again to concrete measures where the six largest cities in Finland, they've already collaborated uh, uh, very actively. They are, uh, they are uh, from all parts of the country. So we want to form a, uh, like a consortia to operate on the Green Deal, how to implement, how, what we can look the evidence, uh, what will be the changes in 10 to 20 years, how to influence and always take both the smart city development, but how to have the industrial uh, participation, how to motivate our citizens. But that should not happen that every city is operating on their own or every unit of the commission is operating there on their own. So we need to build this to do in, in partnerships. And that is what the Committee of the Region is looking for, that we have this uh, kind of group of cities operating with the local collaboration actors and then the similar ones from whatever Bulgaria, Spain and so on. And that is where we learn from the others. And there again, EIT kicks are important because they practically operate already around Europe. Thank you. I thought that's great. Thank you very much. I thought John was making a, a run for it, but he's back. That's great. Clara, did you want to respond? I was going to go on to the next question, but if you want to respond directly, that's fine. Thank you. I think it's, imp it's important um, that uh, what uh, Connie has said, I mean, what everybody has said, but Connie was saying that we need more regulation and more politics and more policy. Indeed, the same as we are saying that we are mainstreaming uh, climate, um, climate mitigation in all policies, and it's true. We are also doing the same with climate adaptation. And when we think of uh, directives like uh, the, the wastewater, uh, directives for the construction materials, there, when we are revising them, we are, we are embedding there the adaptation dimension. Also, something I would like to highlight in, in the context of, uh, of the pi private, private and public um, uh, cooperation and opportunities. When we say that the Green Deal is a growth strategy, it's not only, it's not only a slogan, it's a reality. I mean, when we have to deploy these solutions for, uh, for, uh, for adaptation, there are also business opportunities. So it's a way also whereby by a public policy, we are opening new business opportunities. Mm, last point uh, on, this, on, this, uh, on this common grounds for public and private, insurances. We know we've referred to the to the um, to the um, um, protection gap. We know as well that there are calculations that say that if we increase only by one percent the insurance coverage, the and insurance is part of, of is, is part of also private uh, business. Uh, this will this will uh, diminish the losses uh, created by climate change by um, 22 percent. 22 percent. And this will be savings for the taxpayer and for governments. So in every aspect of the adaptation strategy, nearly in every aspect, you can find this articulation between public and private and neither of them alone can, can succeed. Thank you. Yes, Pirita. Uh, I think um, um, for the, for the, if we look at the mission also, this is really the collaborative approach, this new governance with private and public, this is really the innovation. And as Connie said, it's not easy. This is something that um, uh, Mark was uh, also highlighting when he talks about city, the city already means not only the administration, it means the private sector, it means the universities, it means all the knowledge, uh, it means all this ecosystem in a way. But I don't think this is the case everywhere in, in Europe. And I think we need uh, to really spend some time with this mission and other missions as well, I think, to, to look at how can we create this new governance model that uh, since the beginning uh, really involves those different actors. That's why I think the resilience, uh, climate resilience pact is an interesting way. Uh, it's, uh, it's a way, way to bring the actors together. It's potentially a way to do uh, also linking with the different levels of government and governance. So the, I think these are the elements that uh, are really um, huge. Um, you were saying in the beginning, you don't know what is transformative adaptation. Well, I think uh, we don't maybe know, but we know with whom we should work on it. So this is really, I think, a key for, for, for us in, in this meeting. 
Thank you. And, and John, I will ask you, um, just because I think um, we've asked everybody else, so that's fair. And I think many people will be interested in the role of the private sector in the new RTD world and the new sort of roadmap for research. So uh, anything to add from the RTD side on the balance between sort of public and private? Um, I, I think the problem here is we, the founder of the European Union, Jean Monnet, said when you, when you come across in super set of problems, you have to change the context. And we're talking about a different nature of problems here. So it is the, the private sector, whatever that means, uh, will have to be given the incentives, will have to be given the framing, will have to be given the time and the space to try things out. It's, it's, it's not, maybe it's a form of natural capitalism that we're talking about developing here. It's, it's capitalism, but not as we know it. It's not something that works within the normal ideological boundaries. And the only examples I can give, if you go to the coast of the Netherlands and you see where in the 1950s they decided that whatever happened, whoever was in power, whatever the balance was, they were going to build the sea defences if it took, and it did take 40 or 30 years to do that. Um, but in those days, they had a sufficiently coherent society in which the public, the private, the political systems and even different cultural groups were all working on the same page. We start from a very different situation here. And I don't think the issue is and the private sector will work to incentives. It will work to risk. It will work to shareholder value. It will work to whatever way the governance system globally works. Uh, but it works to incentives. Uh, if you look at the environment we're working in at the moment, I mean, people are dying left and right, and there, we don't have a way of connecting with people as citizens uh, to connect to what is going on around them. There's a very fundamental issue here, I think, in, in terms of how we change the context and how our democracies and how policy, politics, citizens, regions, public and private and all the rest, experience in some way and, and have some kind of common connection uh, to the journey that's ahead. Uh, the only parallel I can think of is when you see new countries or new regions emerging, um, what people are willing to do is shaped by their experience. And maybe in the way that you had military service in the past, people are going to have to work together uh, in different ways, in, in companies, in societies and all the rest, in participating in a really deep way in determining what the problem is for their communities and how they build them. So partners, researchers, investors, insurers, decision makers and the political system that Connie was talking about is not designed currently uh, to actually deal with this and we're dealing in a world in which everything is mediated knowledge so some of the issues that Mark you raised as well it's not simply generating the knowledge and getting it to the people getting it to the people is now the problem so there's even a kind of a constitutional shift that has to take place uh, in bringing these things together so um I, I think there's some kind of way, in, and that's why I think these missions are so important, is to create a space in which we can try and reconfigure the context and then bring everybody into the space and redesign it. It's a bit like if you're in the 1850s and you were told the Industrial Revolution will be taking place in 30 years' time and given the means. This is, the, this is what we've been given now. We've been given the opportunity to prepare for this. But um, my experience as a younger official, when we, we knew there were going to be pandemics happening, Back in the time of the Prodi Commission, I worked on the Public Health Commissioner's team. We put in place the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. And Marco, I remember negotiating in the in the forests of Yunsu, where nobody wanted to have anything to do with this institution. Uh, we tried to put together a work with the industry, saying that you needed spare capacity that would be in your interest. And we tried to change the competencies of the treaties so that in an emergency, people would work together. Everybody knew what was going to happen but nobody was in a position given their incentive structure over time to say, I can do something about this in a long period of time. And I think this is very specific to climate adaptation. We're dealing with very large systemic risks over time and we need a completely new way. And that's why I think that both the strategy and the missions and what Kirsten was talking about and working with regions and places and people, they will work it out, but I think they need new spaces uh, to deal with it. What we, uh want to do now is I think we're going to try uh, see if we can just get one of our um, one of our um, participants to ask a question just to see if this works and um, yeah we can hear you over to you Kit if you'd like to ask your question yeah thank you very much Paul and thank you everyone um, for your fascinating perspectives it's been really really um, interesting this afternoon I think 
for, for me, there's a really big tension that's inevitable in transformation. So there's going to be power dynamics happening at multiple scales where regions and local areas will want to define what transformation means for them and, you know, and what, what, a, what a just and what a climate resilient transformation means. So how do we marry that? How do we, how do we resolve that? How do we reconcile the tension that's going to be there between the need for a, for a common outcome of a climate resilient Europe but within the context of what might look very, very different in, say, France and Nouvelle-Aquitaine to, um, to um, Germany, for example. Thank you. Um, a question about power is going to be something I'm sure you're all going to um, respond to. So we can just go around in turn in no particular order. Kirsten, your microphone is off. So do you want to start? Or was that <laughs> deliberate? Was that a deliberate policy? No. Well, actually, it connects very much to something that, that John's comments made me uh, reflect upon. I think uh, this is a huge topic, um, but just a two cents worth would be some of that has to do with the design. Uh, John was describing a, a shift in the change of context, a reframing of context. And I think with a reframe of context comes a reframe of governance models. I think it really is time that we take Eleanor Ostrom's work off the shelf and into practice. We know that polycentric governance, small groups governing a notion of commons, of con common access to precious resources that have a particularly challenging set of interfaces, that is all about power. It's all about distributed ownership and kind of resting that ownership in the hands of groups and communities who begin to really contract around how how to make sense of and how to use those resources, especially when they're under stress. And I think this Europe is a context in which we can really put that into practice and test it and, and scale it, scale it outwards and learn in different regions where and how and what works. But I think some element of taking some hard won learning and reflection on where we have, what, if you like, social technologies have we got to put into practice when we know that one of the biggest challenges we're going to have is, is, um, is conflict and competition over scarce resources or competition over very volatile situations. So my two cents would, would be that is an element we really need to introduce and we could within these policy environments and in, in what is increasingly a blending of public and private concerns, those are tools and technologies we can use. Excellent, thank you very much. Anyone else want to talk about power and dynamics? Just looking around the panel just to see. Um, Pirita, yes, please. I'm not sure if it's really about power, but I was just wondering uh, about the question because, of course, we will be seeing different type of challenges in different parts of Europe, different regions, different communities. But um, um, maybe I'm being naive, but um, I think there are ways to, to bring those together and we could cluster uh, some of those regions also together based on those different challenges and, and let them work and mutually learn uh, together. So I guess this is going a bit what Kirsten was uh, referring to as well. But um, I would see this rather as an opportunity. Um, we are obviously very happy that this place-based dimension is very strongly uh, now acknowledged in this, uh, both in the strategy and in the mission. So, so clearly um, this, I think, uh, rather opens opportunities for doing things in a very impactful way. So um, yeah, this would be my short answer to that. Thank you, that's great. Um, Connie, uh, John, Mark, anyone of you would like to, I uh, guess, Connie, please, over to you. Yeah. The I mean, the obvious, it's, it's a huge topic, but just to say one thing there, I think that the question raised is just one reason why it is so important to get social science much more into the picture here. I mean, how do we really embrace these kind of transformation and how do we sort of do it while we keep cohesion in society? And, and there has been a tendency, there's a lot of knowledge out there, but it is not part of the common discussion around these things. So my point is just there is also, there are many reasons for this, but there is also a job for the universities, and for the research community there. And somehow we have a huge paradox and dilemma with sort of, for very good reasons, the slowness of the research community. That's what they are there for, to think in deep and, and all these things. But somehow they have to 
start to think about what to do when you have a society where the challenges and the need for solutions and knowledge and communication about these things are accelerating. It is challenging the way we normally think about these things. And, and I just wanted to sort of link to what Marco also said uh, about this speed and agility. I mean, we are not agile enough in Europe. Yeah. It just take the mission boards. It's two years since they just discussed, should we not do this? And, and we're still working on an implementation plan. Nothing has really happened yet. I mean, that's of course not true. And people are working like, I do not know what, working really hard on that. But then when we do something, then we say, okay, yeah, then there's a secretariat there, a few, a handful of people. I mean, you're not doing moonshots with a handful of people. So it's also something about reflecting in Europe, how can we do things a bit more effectively without losing all the good democratic things, of course, but, but it, we know that when we have clear milestones, clear targets, clear directives, we're binding sort of, this is the direction we are moving in, then we, we actually achieve things. But, but we have to work on that because the way that we are progressing now is too slow and we risk that the people most vulnerable will be the biggest losers if we don't change this. Yes, and I can see, uh, uh, Marku, do you want to... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just that, of course, uh, uh, fully agree with Connie on that. And it's really now what people have seen that with the COVID-19, so that when there is a must, so even the political level can react more. We, uh, in the EU, we have started really to do a lot big investments together and so on. So when there is a must, then it's it's a reality. But it's more and more the same that we are now seeing with the climate. And take an example of that, the public opinion on polluting in Finland with 200,000 lakes. So many of the lakes have been too much polluted or the Baltic Sea, uh, partly due to the Soviet Union, Russia and so on. But it's it's really, uh, cities who have polluted a lot, so the Baltic Sea as well, not only from the Russian side so also. But now there is a public opinion that we can do more and we have realized we have done a lot and good, good results with the uh, cleaning uh, many of the lakes which were polluted either due to pulp and paper industry or due to the agriculture locally. And so, so there, is, uh, there is a joint kind of commitment now to invest more on this. And this is what we need to do with the whole climate, because as was mentioned in the beginning by Clara about the, the financial losses, so what happens? And that is everywhere, all parts of Europe are seeing these heat waves or, or, or uh, uh, forest fires, uh, earthquakes and so on. So awareness will be coming on and, and, and more and more. So, but we need to get the, the industry to move ahead as well. And this is why we in, in the Scandinavian countries, we work a lot with the industrial leaders to, to, and they are very committed. And there is a huge difference. We still need to do more in Europe. When I talked a couple of months ago with my Committee of the Region colleague member from Spain, he said that he gets only his local industry to look for one or two years ahead. And we are looking at these huge investments for the global uh, economy and global business for 10 to 20 or 30 years, big investments. So there is much, much that we need to do with the, with the knowledge and understanding as well. Absolutely. And just to check, John or Clara, do you want to uh, respond or should we go to the next question? I can see Clara says no. John, are you okay? Three words. Um, um, um destination, uh, uh, delibera deliberation and demonstration. What Connie has said uh, is extremely important that it has to be now, uh, we need to find a way of actually demonstrating how to do deliberation uh, in, in complex evidence-based long-term uh, issues. And it's um, the social scientists, as, as we all know, Clara, you'll remember, are never happy uh, with the Horizon program and all the rest. And here's the open invitation, here's your moment. How are we going to, we can't design it from the top, but if you take the complex uh, decision-making uh, test sites in Europe, if you look at the way France is looking at climate 
or the different participatory process in Ireland around uh, those, the most difficult political rights issues around. There is experience there. And I think if you trust people and you give them the means and the space and the time and the knowledge, I think this is going to take time. They will find a way, but they need to be in a space where they can actually uh, also test and fail uh, to answer one of your other questions, how to make decisions. Um, and the kind of decisions we're talking about are not the kind of decisions that generally have been taken by the demos in the past. It's been taken by somebody up there, you know, where people will live, where our food will come from, you know, how our value chains are organized. Uh, in the past, in the history of human civilizations, disasters happen, people move and, 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 they, and they move on. That's not how we are now. Uh, and destination, I think, is very important. And on this, I think very simple exercises can help in that space is you give people a sense that a destination is possible, which is better. Most people are starting to feel, feel that nothing is possible. There's a catastrophism that leads to kind of Trumpian denialism. If you can involve people, that's what the missions are about, and say, look, here's the knowledge, here are the possible solutions, and get them to do something they did in, in the Netherlands uh, last year, where they had the, you know, the old Al Gore map of the Netherlands in 100 years time, which is basically blue, you know, it's just water. Um, or you have this other map where if we applied every single known innovation, nature-based solution and best practice, what would the Netherlands look like? And all of a sudden you had a complete vision of society. There was a huge engagement of society. What would that mean where I live? You know, what would farming look like? Where would we work and so forth? I think those kind of exercises, but they had to be place-based and supported by the social science communities are the kind of things that the admission boards need to deliver and demonstrate. Um, right. Uh, I think we're going to the last question. Now, what I'm going to do now is we have two questions left and I'm going to give you a choice of um, trying to answer both of them very quickly in the same reply or answering one or the other that you like the most. So the two questions that we have left, one is around um, the mission approach and the fact that we're going to have some solutions that win and some that won't and some that fail. And it's really about how we change the culture and the politics so that we have a different way of working um, that allows for that failure and allows for um, that type of thing. So that's the first question. The second one I think is really important and it's about um, youth. It's about how young researchers, how young um, participants uh, and people can play a role in this process. So those are the two questions that we have. Um, I'll go around to each of you in turn in no particular order. Um, but yeah, so one question around, uh, you know, how do we change the culture of research to, uh, to allow us to fail? And the second one about engaging with the youth. Um, so anyone want to offer to start first? Oh, Marku, I can see your hands up. Yeah. And then after, oh, and then I'll, Kirsten and then Clara. Thank you. I'll, I'll start uh, only with the, 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 the second question about the youth, because Committee of the Regions, we have uh, been doing and are doing a lot more with the, the young uh, people with the both locally but on the EU level as well so when we look the uh, the the future of Europe so we've integrated their young people they collaborate practically regularly with us but then we have the instrument European entrepreneurial region which is now especially focusing on on the sustainable development issues we'll publish the results of this uh, last call now for the next two years, there will be six regions after a very thorough analy analysis of the proposals of the activities. And there are a lot dealing with the youth and startups and so on. So we collaborate all, already very much with DG Grow, but now when it is it's towards, uh, towards uh, the uh, climate and sustainability. So let's link this as well with the missions and especially DG Klima and RTD. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Great. And just to advise our participants, we've got about four minutes left. So we've got just about time, I think, to do everything. But we, um, um, yeah, if you can just uh, um, uh, keep your answers relatively short and everyone will have a turn. Kirsten, I think you are next. Well, then why don't I, I'm just going to answer the one on how do we shift our approach to uh, research and innovation so that we don't keep trying to back winners. Um, I think um, there's a really critical question here about shifting the paradigm of innovation itself for research and innovation. And that really is, we are currently, we have a notion of research and innovation, which is about finding answers and finding solutions. We use that language. We're facing the most significant complex 
overwhelming transformation in, in the entire of human history, and we simply do not know how to do this. So we have lots of possibilities, but actually how to transform whole places, whole regions, whole cultures, whole societies, and whole businesses in the next 10 years is a big deal. So I think one of the big shifts that, that we can make, that the Commission can make, and that Europe can make, is very much about shifting our mindset. We need innovation to help us ask better questions, to help us learn and to help us build capability. And it's probably time that we just recall Darwin's reflection on the species that survive are the ones that are most adaptable to change. We need to build a capability to adapt and to constantly learn and to constantly test. And that by definition means there's no point in saying, let's try and run a kind of competitive process in every city and work out which is the winning solution. We're gonna need five solutions simultaneously as fast as we can possibly get to work out what combination of things we haven't even begun to understood would actually help us. I think that is a policy design question. It's a policy design choice. There is an, an expert group um, are currently working with DGITD on precisely this question, the ESIO group. And it is exactly in that space of saying, shift what we ask research and innovation to do. It's very relevant to, to the second question on what we ask researchers to do. And there's one reflection I wanted to make on, can I, can I on that. Can Go on, sorry, one very quick reflection, please. Yeah, we, no, we I really must move on. There are, two, there are two things that are about to happen in Europe that would help us do this. One is the new European Bauhaus, and one is the creation of a kick on creative media and arts. Stories help people change. Narratives that tell a meaningful story. Why do this? What's the hope? What will make it different? What's in it for us? That kind of engagement, not just social sciences as a, as a technical exercise, it really is the stories of, stories of the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then Clara, can I ask you, please? Thank you very quickly. You were asking about uh, the risk uh, in, in research. Research is a risky business by definition. I mean, there is no research if there is no risk behind, and there is no need for any public intervention if there was no risk. So I think those are things that uh, there is, we are going to invest uh, in research and everything will be successful. I mean, I, I think they don't know what's the research and innovation, by the way, business. So I think this, I'm sure this will be embedded in the region, in the, and, and of course, climate, adapt climate change and climate ad adaptation is about risk as well. So we are in a risky business. We'll try to, 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 to be responsible risk takers, but we have to be risk takers. On the youth, uh, Mr. Timmermans, our executive vice president, always says that he thinks that probably the Green Deal would not be there or would have not been there as early as in this college if we didn't have the, the push, the, the stimulus uh, of the young generation. They are going, they are those that are going to suffer us. They are, they are uh, going to live in the world that we are going to live for them and they are active actors. And let me just in one second remind ourselves that in the pact for the climate, we have, we expect that the youth is an, plays an active role also to provide solutions and visions about how we have to handle this uh, climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Perita, can I ask you perhaps to give us... Yeah, I will be very short. I will uh, answer the issue on the mission approach. Um, uh, I think that the mission approach is really a key for the transformation. It is a risky business, but this is what I think that the mission uh, missions can really help us to, to answer to those uh, these very difficult questions. Uh, I also uh, think that um, uh, it is beyond, we are talking about something beyond RNI. So it all starts with this uh, notion of, of research and innovation, but it's about mainstreaming, as Clara has been saying. It will, uh, we need to be, uh, uh, shift swift so we have to uh, link up RNI we need to link up mainstreaming and we need to do that in an agile way now uh, and not wait uh, for 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 years and years to do so great thank you um, and we have Connie and John left just to give us a final reflection um, Connie over to you extremely great yeah, I agree 100% with what Clara said if public money be it national or European for research are not more risk willing than private why then have it so it, it, it must be and, and the other thing is just on the mission saying there has been and there is a tendency in Europe and many many states 
in Europe that we want to sort of do a little bit of everything. And I think the mission approach is trying to break away from, from that and say, at least let us try really and address some of the big challenges. And we need to do that also in light of competition with other economies. This is a, a cultural change that we need to go through. Thank you. That's, uh, and, and finally, John, over to you. If you look at what's happening around us at the moment, I mean, we, we've had all these abstract discussions about intergenerational problems. And when we talk about systemic approaches, I think the generational aspect now has to be part of looking at how we tell the stories, what Kirsten has said, and, and uh, the investments. And what has been said so well by, by, by Connie and, and, and Clara and Brita and others, um, when I, when I was kind of, as an aside, this is a personal view, I'm not speaking on behalf of the European Commission, but when, when I said earlier on about planetary service, I mean, the idea that people should be allowed to take time to get involved in thinking about working on decision making at local level in their communities, and the way that you would on justice, where we have, you know, um, um, a court service and so forth, I think there's an issue of bringing the generations together. If you see what's happening in the pandemic at the moment, we're starting to see the first signs where people can actually literally eliminate other people of different generations from their thinking and behavior and decision making and discount them because there is no connection. And I think this is a first sign. And if, if we get into a situation where it's only the young or the old or the rich or the poor, whoever else it is, have a handle on, on how we adapt. I think we're in difficulty. So for the young people coming through, be they researchers or practitioners, part of the missions have to do and part of what we have to do is to create a space in which people young and old can participate creating a space again in which the things we talk about the transformation the deliberation the demonstration the, the failure the ways in which research and knowledge public and private can work i think there needs to be an engage an actual engagement as citizens in a space where we're allowed to take part in, in developing that i think that's 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 a personal view anyway uh, I, I just reminded of what Roosevelt did back in the 30s when he just let lots and lots of people go out there and fix the parks and get involved in rebuilding their, their communities and railways. And that, that great generation of people shaped a whole way of doing democracy and fairness in society. And I think if you trust people, young and old, by and large, uh, once you don't have commission requirements for balance and doing everything at the, at the same time, they'll get there. So I, 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 and thank you, by the way, for the opportunity to comment on that question. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, what I would like to do now is just close the session off. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Normally you'd be hearing lots and lots of applause. Unfortunately, you can't hear that. Um, but I know from, uh, I'm sure I've enjoyed that session absolutely immensely. And it's been um, really insightful. And I, I know all of our participants will have well. So, so thank you very much. I will now close the session. Um, the, this is available. You can go and watch this, I think now as well. Um, and, and so thanks again to our panelists. Thank you all to our uh, participants thank and good night. Have a lovely evening.